Hey everyone, this is Melissa, and I'm the talkative introvert. In today's episode, I am joined by Brandon Kam- Kamarasamy. Uh, he is the founder of Master Talk, where he coaches ambitious executives and entrepreneurs to become the top 1% communicators in their industry. He also has a YouTube channel by the same name, where the goal is to provide free access to communication tools for everyone. So Brandon, thank you so much for joining me today. Of course, Melissa. Pleasure is mine. It's good to be here. So before we get into the episode, I do ask, Oh my gosh. I feel like I know what you are, Uh, but are you an introvert, extrovert, or somewhere in the middle, an ambivert? I'm what we call the extra extrovert, the extreme extrovert, (laughs) as extrovert as they come. Extreme extra extrovert. I like that. Why why are you an extra extrovert? I'm an extra extrovert, I think because of the level of energy that I have. So whenever I'm, I'm at a, like I'm nuts. Sometimes I do like 10 interviews in a day, like I'm crazy. (laughs) <laughs> right, because it's, it's just like I just love it. I love people. I love talking to people. I, I now because you're getting them on the last meeting. You know all that all that juice kind of like got dialed out throughout the day, and you get me kind of you get introverted, Brendan, for like the last hour that he's awake. Oh really? <laughs> and, but then the next and then the next morning I wake up and I'm like, what's up, everyone? And I'm back. Uh, but yeah, I get a lot of energy from people. That's why I'm an extra extra. That's why I love doing this. Oh yeah, yeah. I um. Did watch some of your YouTube videos and I was like, man, this guy's got high energy. I can yeah, I'm just high tell. On life. <laughs> so how many interviews did you do today? Today? I have to check my calendar. How many did I do today? If I had to ballpark, probably like six or something. Wow. So you're in a lot of podcasts. Yeah, I really love them. It doesn't even get me that much business. It's just like super fun to talk to people. Yeah, I did like six today. Because I always learn something. Yeah. From the, I got interviewed once by like a the CEO of like an animal sanctuary. I didn't even know what that was. Oh, so, so I, yeah. So I get on a I get on the podcast and the guy's like, "Your video has changed my life." And I was like, "What do you mean?" I thought he was just kidding. And he was like, "Yeah, I'm raising money for these animals who live on my sanctuary." <laughs> I was like, "I thought he was kidding." And then in ten minutes, later, I was like, "Oh no, this is legit. This is an actual." like sanctuary and he's raised like hundreds of thousands of dollars to help these pigs and these goats and i never would have thought see so that's i learned that because i never thought like one of the people was watching my videos was like some some amazing guy who's like saving pigs and stuff so yeah because public speaking really is used everywhere and anywhere and like in even if an animal animal sanctuary you don't really think like you need public speaking because like you're talking to animals all day um but you know if you're trying to get like funding or trying to get support like you need to like go out there and talk to people so that makes sense yeah because at first i was like animal sanctuary like why is he watching your videos (laughs) but that makes sense Yeah. yeah that's pretty cool yeah thanks melissa so yeah i always learn something from people you know, I'm sure there's something you're going to teach me. I already learned something. I, there's awesome shirts at Target that I did not know about. Yeah. So, so before to... we recorded, uh, Brandon was telling me that he liked my shirt. And um, what is this? It's a My Hero Academia. And it's like all the Sanrio characters. So you could get it at Target. I'm not, you know, no affiliate to Target or anything. But you know, <laughs> everyone loves Target. <laughs> Speaking of Target, this episode is sponsored by, no, I'm kidding. It's funny because when I was on vacation last week, we were opening up My Hero Academia kind of uh, uh, trading card packets. I don't know if you knew oh, they okay. existed. It's really no. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> well, if you want the shirt, you know, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, Melissa. <laughs> they have the randomest things, but I love it. And it's very comfortable. Anyways, today is not about Target. <laughs> Um, so I know I, I touched on Master Talk a little bit in the intro, but do you want to kind of explain what it is and why you started it? Yeah, for sure, Melissa. Happy to. So, so the story started in business school. I went to I went to university college, and and I did these things called case competitions. Think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So other guys my age are playing like baseball and football and basketball. I wasn't one of those guys. 
So I did presentations competitively, and that's how I learned how to speak. But then as I got older, I started coaching a lot of the students on communication, not because I was a great communication coach, because the alternative they had was a rock, so they might as well just pick me because I was coaching them for free. And that's how I learned how to speak. And then by the time I was 22, I gained a lot of experience and I realized that no one was sharing what I was sharing for free on the internet. So I started making videos in my mom's basement where I still live, by the way, on that couch over there. And then a few years later, it just turned to something I never thought it would. Nice. I um I didn't realize that there's competition, or did you say competitions on public speaking? Yeah, I didn't either until I got until I got to university. Like I got there and I thought because I wanted to get a job, right? That was my focus. It wasn't like this cool like be a YouTuber. I just wanted to be an executive at a company because I didn't have a lot of money and I wanted to retire my mom. So I had this oversized prom suit from Sears, which is like a bankrupt company now. Oh, that I spent so like a hundred bucks. Yeah, it's like good memories. And <laughs> then uh, I would <laughs> I would go to these these cocktails when I was nineteen, and I would talk to the older kids and I say, "How did you get a job?" And I thought they would say, "Study hard and get good grades." None of them said that, except maybe one. Most of them said case competitions, and I was like, "What the heck is that?" And that's when I learned it's kind of like a it's like a sports draft, but okay. for business jobs where executives of companies come to these competitions, they sponsor them like Amazon. And then their executives look at the best presenters and give them automatic job offers. Pretty wild. That's crazy. So are you given like a special prompt? Like do it, does everyone have the same prompt and you, you pick who has the best speech, I guess. You got it. I mean, I mean, since we're talking about target, let's use to use target as an example. I think I did one case on target a long time ago, but basically let's say there's a 20 page document that explains target the stores, how many locations they have. And then they say at the end, you know, Melissa, we don't know whether or not we should be expanding to Germany or Portugal. Which country should we expand to and why? So you do a bunch of analysis and then you give the executives direction. You give them a solution. You say, we need to go here and here's why. But we're 20-year-old kids. So you kind of have to give the best solution. But what the really execs they're looking for is like, what can you do in three hours? And a lot of the students present better than the executives at the company. So they go, whoa, okay, we got to hire this person. And that's how people get jobs in business school anyways. That's crazy. I would never. I would never do that. <laughs> that seems so stressful. <laughs> exactly. It's because nobody did them that there wasn't a lot of competition for jobs. Because only like 1% of the faculty did these competitions. Because you're right. Who the heck would put them through the this? It's like nuts. And that's why all the people who did decide to put them through that got got a ton of great results from it. So other than the podcast, do you still do a lot of public speaking? Yeah, I do. I do some workshops. I would say a lot of my time is really podcasts because podcasts are super fun and they're not as stressful. They're not as crazy. Whereas when you're doing corporate workshop, obviously you get paid to do those things, but there's a lot more expectations, you know, like you have to design the workshop, get everything done put a nice put a nice dress shirt on go out and and present and get the results so yeah i do some but most of it is podcasting and youtube content creation okay yeah i don't i know podcasting is technically public speaking because you're speaking to the public but i do not see it as public speaking at all because right now it's just me and you you know and when I do my solo episodes, it's literally me and my computer. Like I don't have to see anybody. There's no audience. So I don't really see as public speaking. Like it's way, way easier um, than being in front of a, an entire audience. That's just, that's a lot. I mean, I do, I guess the closest thing I do to public speaking is facilitating meetings, but it's just gotten so much easier now that I work from home instead of like doing it in the office. So that's been nice. <laughs> yeah, no, the online world has definitely been friendly to introverts because it's created more options for us to communicate. And that's what's great because, you know, a lot of people, Melissa, they wouldn't they would they would be scared just to start a podcast. Right. So we all we're all at different levels and you're a lot further along than you than you might think. You know, you're not you're not that far off. I, I know key, I know people who keynote for a ton of money and they're scared to start a podcast and guest in a podcast. So so you, it's the spectrum is really wide basically. Yeah. I, I've been teetering on 
doing a podcast for a while. And then finally I just, just decided to do it. Cause I'm like, who's going to listen to me anyways. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I said the same thing when I started master talk. I mean, I was 22 years old on my mom's ba- in my mom's basement with the phone, no money, and I had a bachelor's degree in accounting. So yeah, I didn't think anyone was going to listen to me either, but you never know what happens in life. That's true. It's kind of it's it still gets me when someone reaches out to me. So I'm like, oh my god, there's there's actually people out there. They're <laughs> they're actually listening, you know, because I do get downloads. So obviously, someone's downloading it, and it's just it's. I don't know. It's crazy, but you know, you don't see them. So you don't really think about it, but okay. I have to ask you cause you look super young. Do you I, mind if I ask you how old you are? No, you can ask me anything. Melissa. Okay. <laughs> I'm easy going. Probably the most easy going person you have on the show. Actually. I know that, I know that that seems counter to some of the, my professional videos on YouTube where I'm all suited up and stuff. But uh, but yeah, I'm pretty pretty easy going. So I'm 26, and I started I started coaching when I was 19. I started the YouTube channel when I was 22. Oh, okay, you just look really young. So when you said like I did this when I was 19, I'm like you look 19. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. I do look 19. But yeah, it's been seven <laughs> years. It's crazy how much I honestly can't even believe. Like my sister tells me this all the time. Who lives with me, by the way? Me and my mom. Mm-hmm. We all live together. And and yeah, she. She still can't believe I'm 26. I can't even believe I'm 26. Crazy how much time flies. Yeah, I turned uh, 30 this year. You're 30? What? Yeah. Did you not (laughs) see that? No. (laughs) Okay. You got like your Target shirt on. and. I I, I thought you were like my age or something, like 27, 26 or something. Oh, no, no. I am 30. (laughs) I have reached that. That 30 mark. Um, but I, just, I do s- still feel like a kid. Me too. Yeah. Maybe because I don't have my own kids. But that's okay. <laughs> that's fair. You can, yeah, wait. It's fine. <laughs> um, so you do help people with speaking. Like that's that's your that's the main thing for Master Talk, right? Is you're coaching people. And so do you have a lot of introvert clients? I do. So Mestruck is two things. One is is the coaching and the other part is creating free content for people who can't afford me. That's really the big mission. So I use a lot of the client money that I make and then I use it to kind of pay for all the production costs behind my YouTube channel. And yeah, I would say most of my clients are introverts. Probably if I had to put a ballpark, 80% are introverts, yeah. So why do people... Go to like what's the main reason they want to learn about public speaking or how to get better at it? Yeah, great question, Melissa. So there's kind of two parts to the answer. One is communication in general, and the second one is investing real money into communication coaching. So those are two different targets. So the first one is really people who just have an interest in communication for for multiple reasons. Because like the question I always ask is like, how would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? But for all of us, the answer to that question is actually different. Because some people want to have a better relationship with their families. Other people want to get more healthy. Other people want to get their next job promotion. Other people want to be a thought leader in a keynote. Other people want to be a podcast host and the list goes on, right? So so the, the reason can be really different for people. So, but the, but the, but the concepts of mass talk apply to everybody. So it's very, it's a lot more general public. But the coaching side is is a bit different, Melissa. The coaching side is a different conversation, which is who is actually willing to spend money on communication? And generally, almost all of the people who spend money on communication generally want to make more money in exchange for that coaching. So let me give me a simple example. Let's say we're, we're working with a technology executive. Most of our clients are in tech. So they're really good at coding. Right, naturally, right. Mm-hmm. So, right. So, really good at tech, super good at software development. You know, the 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 guys and the girls they're making, you know, multiple six figures, or at least six figures starting, but they can't they can't get to managerial positions because they don't know how to lead people. So, for that person, spending a few grand working with a communication coach is life changing if they put in the work because they'll get their next promotion, which is like a twenty thirty thousand dollar increase in their salary. So, it's like a hundred times their money over the next ten years. So that that type of person, the ho- the podcast host who wants like millions and millions of downloads, that person will work with the speech coach. 
uh, do, who else? Those are the two. And then the entrepreneur, of course. Like somebody who has a PhD, Melissa, scientific, really deep technology, but can't communicate their ideas to somebody who doesn't understand their tech, which is like 99.9% of the human population. So, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense that a lot of them come from tech because I, so I'm from IT. That's my that's my actual job. You know, I work in IT. Dun, but dun, I, dun. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't do any of the technical stuff. Like I'm not a developer. I don't know coding. So I'm in the project management office and we are all about communication and talking to people. We're the liaison between, you know, vendor and client and all this stuff. And it is pretty crazy how, um, like, because the developers, they do make more money than me. They just, <laughs> they do. I, I, I've seen their cars and the things they wear. And <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the, the things they wear. I don't think developers spend money on nice clothes, but fair enough. <laughs> Oh, some people do. Like, really? I remember, yeah, a lot of them do. A lot of them are, like, some, they're not all your typical nerdy guys, you know? Like, there's some of those for sure. But I've seen developers wear, like, fancy gold watches and brand clothes. And, and like, it's not like they need to either because they don't usually see the client. They're not client facing. They're just, like, literally downstairs with all the other dudes. Um, I say dudes because most of them are guys. Uh, most of them are dudes. <laughs> yeah. Um, not saying that women can't, but for some reason, it's just a very, you know, male dominant place. Plus, I don't know if I want to be down there either. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, they have the fancy cars and the fancy clothes and they definitely, definitely make more than I do. Uh, but what was I getting at with that? Oh, so me being part of like the project management office, like these dudes really do have a difficulty speaking. And sometimes we have to bring in an expert right to a meeting to explain how things are going because I'm not technical. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the, all these like numbers and letters mean. And so we'll bring them on and sometimes they're good speakers. And sometimes it's, it's like, ah, just like, I want to uh, speak for you. Like, I want to figure out what you're trying to say. <laughs> you're like pulling hair out of your teeth, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that makes sense that a lot of them will go to you for that. Uh, but that's kind of, that's cool. So for the coaching, is this like, uh, are they mostly for specific projects or is it just like overall, they just want to build their skills? You got it. So it's usually around for the tech people, Melissa, it's usually around their next career growth opportunity. So they're usually a senior engineer or they just hit manager. So they're either looking for that next promotion and they're close to it. And they've generally already been rejected for it. So they did they did their leadership interview and the the people the, the people say you got the right technical prowess, but you don't have you don't have the EQ to, to lead people. Because obviously, as you know, since you know the industry well, when, when you become like a, a VP of engineering, you're not spending any of your time coding. You're just managing other people who are coding. So so that's the key. Leadership is super important. So usually they, they, they messed up their interview and that so they feel the pain and they go like, no, like my next salary increase is like madness. So I need to work with somebody to just get me there regardless of how much it costs. So it depends depends it's it's all about those little niche groups but it's really about getting to the next level and then for CEOs it's raising capital yeah for people who are not familiar with project management or management in general so just for context i just completed the project management leadership academy program for the state and sounds super fancy but it, it is it does so much about communication and people skills. Like it's all the soft skills. They talk about like how to build a relationship with the, uh, with your counterparts and how to speak to people and how to identify speaking techniques or how to identify people's communication styles. Like it's all about people and talking to people and how to do how to present yourself to like even upper management. Like we did a whole class about public speaking too. And it like reminded me of you. I was like, hmm, I wonder if he thinks like, you know, what he thinks about this class. But <laughs> yeah, I give a lot of those too. Yeah. 
Yeah. So management really, yeah, like you said, they don't do any of the grunt work anymore. It's it's really just your relationship with people and how to talk. So, yeah. Uh, so you said earlier that a lot of your clients are introverts. So what have you caught on about introverts and in speaking? Like what is something that you, you learned from them since you yourself are, is an extra extrovert? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, I'm, I think the best speakers or really the best at anything, they always want to learn from the other side. So there's actually a lot of lessons I learned from introverts. And I would say the most important one is in many ways, they're actually a lot better than extroverts or communication. It just introverts don't really realize it. So let's go through these three things. So the first thing, Melissa, is that introverts are exceptional listeners. And the reason they're exceptional listeners is because they speak less. So naturally, they're going, they're going to listen more versus me. I'm the, the extra extra. I'm the one yapping. I'm the one on the podcast going blah, 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 just talking. So it was really hard for me to listen to people. It took me years to get it right. And I'm still working on it. But an, an introvert has very little trouble knowing how to listen to people. So they'll adapt their message much faster and have a lot more empathy for their audience than, a, than an extrovert who hasn't practiced those specific skills. That's number one. Number two is introverts are really good at pausing, Melissa. So they're able to take a breath so that they can draw emphasis to specific parts of their message. And the reason it comes really easy to them once you just tell them, hey, John, you know, if you just pause here in your presentation, you'll sound better. John will get it there really quickly. And the reason, Melissa, is because they're already comfortable in silence. Because they spend less time talking, they're super comfortable by just pausing. They're like, yeah, okay. And then they, they're able to pause for long periods of time. But extroverts struggle with pausing because we have trouble keeping space in a conversation. So let's say I'm at a party and I'm talking to someone and there's a space. I immediately want to fill it up. Oh, so Melissa, what's your favorite color? You know, it's like I'm always trying to fill up the space. Introverts can just sit there and just like stare at you. <laughs> so, so they're very good at pausing. That's number two. Number three is not well known, Melissa, which is. Introverts are actually a lot more accessible as communicators than extroverts are. So let me give you an example. Let's say we take Gary Vaynerchuk. Okay, Gary V, for those who don't know, is CEO of VaynerMedia, has a massive social media following. The guy is super extroverted. And I say that with respect to him because I love his work. I'm a big fan. But you either love the guy or you don't. You either go, wow, this guy's the best, or get this guy away from me. There's no in-between with Gary Vaynerchuk. Right? But nobody really says that about Brene Brown. Like when we think about Brene Brown, nobody says, I hate Brene Brown. Because if you say that, you'll go to jail. The FBI will come knocking on your door and throw you in jail. Right? Like nobody says that. And that's the conclusion. Introverts are more accessible as communicators than extroverts. That's why, by the way, I've intentionally – in case you, you haven't noticed, Melissa, I've intentionally changed my energy for this specific episode. So notice how I'm not really loud, which is my usual uh, way of speaking, is that I've actually changed my tone so that I'm more accessible to your introverted audience. So there you go. Interesting. I didn't know that you did that. I mean, I thought maybe you're just tired because it's like towards the end of the day. <laughs> I this can is tell also you're... true. Yeah, I can tell the energy is a little different from like your YouTube videos, but I'm just like, eh, it's like seven o'clock here. I don't know where you're at, but I'm in Montreal. Seven. So New oh, York yeah. time. Okay. So you're what, three hours ahead, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But but the thing is, Melissa, that I want to emphasize is if you got – which I wasn't expecting at all. So if you, if you did show up that way, I would have been like, whoa. Is, is uh, you know, if you showed up like super energetic, like, yo, what's up, Brendan? Really excited. Like say this is the talkative extrovert. I would have turned on. Even if it's 1030 right now, I would have turned on and, and just mirrored your energy. But since, you're, since the audience is more introverted and, and you're a bit more on the introverted side too, I, I've, I've changed the energy. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that because as much as I love my extroverted friends and family, the high energy and the loud volume for some reason instantly makes me tired. I get like exhausted. Like when you got loud earlier, I was like, mm, please don't. <laughs> like, <laughs> it like got me, you know, 
Uh, but I really appreciate you doing that because that is, you know, that's one of the things I learned in the academy is to identify people's speaking styles. And they had like a, um, what was it? They said, it's the golden rule. The golden rule is, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. And I think their silver rule was speak to others how they want to be spoken to or something like that. That's good. Yeah. I was like, that's good. Yeah. Because um, what you're saying about the other guy, I forgot his name already. I feel like I know who you're talking about. Cause I, I remember seeing a video of a guy uh, who was like a public speaker and he was just so high energy, so loud, so like out of, you know, just extreme and then just, just his presentation, just his welcoming presentation, his introduction. I was instantly tired. I was like, Nope, not for me <laughs> On to the next. So, yeah, I think it's important to identify that. Uh, so for your introverted clients though is there something that you think they can learn from extroverted people and extroverted speakers that's an excellent question melissa you're absolutely right and the takeaway from all this by the way is it doesn't matter what side of the spectrum you fall the key is understand your strengths but also take get the strengths from the other side too and have all of the above so so what's the what's the strengths of extroverts three main ones the first one is vocal projection. Extroverts don't need a mic. They're really good at projecting their voice. So if they're in a situation where the mic isn't working, they'll just speak louder. And the reason is not because they're ne ne necessarily extroverted that they have this gift. It's because they just spend more time talking on average. So if they're at a party, they're, they're usually at parties, clubs, bars, those types of events where you need to actually increase your vocal tone projection because there's a lot of people around you. And they do karaoke a lot too. So yes. so the right, so the vocal cords get practiced a lot more. So the range is much higher than an introvert. So that's number one. But that and but the reason I say that is because it can be practiced. Right? Range can be practiced even if you're an introvert. That's number one. Second one, extroverts are really good at taking risk, Melissa. They're not afraid to say the extra joke, even if the extra joke isn't funny. They're not afraid to try something out. You know, I once had a crazy idea once. I was, I was speaking to a group of like young teenage girls, teenagers of like seven and 14. And I was not able to get their attention. It was so hard because it was like a Sunday morning and no one wanted to listen to the, to the old guy. I'm the old guy because if they're seven, I'm the old guy. So nobody <laughs> wants to listen to me. So, so I had this idea once. I never actually did it, but I had this weird idea of like, what if I bring a bouquet of roses and just leave it in front of me and never tell anyone why those bouquet of roses are there? <laughs> so, like, so I'm always like, we're always trying to figure out weird ideas to get people's attention and to get them engaged. That's the second piece. And we're not afraid to take the risk. And then I would say the third piece is that because we're better at socializing, it's easier for us to get, how do I say this? It's easier for us to ask the harder questions to our audience to get the results that we're looking for. So for example, if there's an uncomfortable question that we feel we need to ask an audience member during dinner to get the insight we're looking for, the introvert might not ask that question, but the extrovert will to get the answer that they're looking for. I really resonate with that that first one about the vocal projection because I mean you can hear me now obviously but in real life you'd probably have a really hard time hearing me. I am extremely soft spoken so much so that it's super annoying because people always can't hear me. <laughs> and it's really irritating. I didn't know that you can practice that though. Like that's really interesting because my, I'll take my cousin, for example, she doesn't really listen to the podcast. So I can say this, but she's super loud, <laughs> like super loud. And before the pandemic, she, I mean, I, I think, yeah, everything's open now. So I guess I could say this now, uh, but she used to go clubbing a lot and she would go, you know, hang out with her friends a lot. And it's loud. Like I've been to the clubs before and the bars and it is extremely loud. Like, I don't understand why has to be that loud. Like you can't even have a conversation with anybody 
But yeah, if you're in that all the like every weekend and you're surrounded by people all the time, I guess I can understand how you can exercise your voice to be louder. But I can go days without speaking. Like if my husband, if I was single and I wasn't married and I was just living by myself and I didn't have like a dog or anything, uh, I've gone through days where I don't talk. Like if I don't have a meeting that day, which is very rare, but sometimes I'll have a day where I don't have any meetings. And if my husband didn't exist, my dog didn't exist, I probably wouldn't even talk that day at all. Just be completely <laughs> silent. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, I talk a lot in my head. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do we have for breakfast? What are we going to have for lunch? Yeah. yeah. I'm like constantly talking to myself in my head. <laughs> but yeah, it's not vocal though. That's interesting. And, and that's, and I think that's the key is it is totally possible to practice it, Melissa. You just got to be willing to do it. And that's why it goes back to, you know, a question I ask a lot of people, how would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? You know, for me, communication is all about dreaming about what we want. We dream about the expensive cars we want to buy, the watches we want to get, the vacations we want to go on. But we don't really dream about a world in which we're a better speaker in it. And if we start doing that, that's what pushes introverts to go, you know what? I don't have to go to the club, but maybe I could do a little bit of karaoke. Maybe <laughs> I could do a little bit of conversation just so I can increase my range when I need it. Yeah, I was very I was very fortunate when I started off in IT. I had this director and we had to launch a project <laughs> and he took me under his wing, which was very generous of him. And he's like, Okay, so you're going to launch this project, but we have to do twenty six kickoff meetings. And I was like, Okay, you know, like whatever. Um but, and then he's like, but you're going to facilitate every single one and you're going to explain the project for ev for all 26 meetings. And he's like, but it's okay. Like, I'll be there with you, but I'll tell you now after the fourth meeting, you got this and you're not going to even, you know, sweat about it for the rest of it. It's only going to take you like these four meetings or whatever. And I did it in the very first one. I stumbled a lot and like he can tell because I'm like staring at him, like sweating and I'm like, please help me. Um, so he did help me with those. But yeah, after like a few of them, like I was good. I was solid. I had my, my speech down and it was awesome, but it, I'm not sure if I would recommend that route though. Cause that was very nerve wracking, <laughs> but how do you like, what do you do with your, your clients? Like, do you, do you practice rounds with them or like how do they practice public speaking with you? Absolutely. So here's here's what I would say, Melissa. Thanks so much for sharing your, your story. Shout out to, to your mentor. Awesome <laughs> that he did that. Sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze. <laughs> so oh, I, okay. I was like, what happened? <laughs> You're like, what's going on with Brendan? Yeah, so so going back to this, how how we build the confidence, especially with introverts, is the biggest thing is just breaking the mindset barrier. Because everyone who signs up for communication coaching always believes they can't be a great speaker. Always. So we need to break that barrier. So the next question becomes, what is the easiest possible win that we can deliver for anyone, whether an introvert or an extrovert, that will help them get the result and make them feel that they're getting momentum in what they're doing? So I don't start with the hard meeting at work because it's not fun anymore. I start with the random word exercise. Super simple exercise. Well, it sounds simple. Pick a random word like glasses, like target, like table, like lights, and give random presentations out of thin air with no preparation. And what I always tell people, Melissa, is if you can make sense out of nonsense, you could make sense out of anything. So usually when somebody does the random word exercise, even if it's an introvert, they're usually suck at it the first five, 10 times. But and what I tell them is we don't get points on how well we do the exercise. We get points on how many times we do it. So after an introvert does this like 50 times, which only takes an hour, by the way, because the random word exercise took like 60 seconds, right? So it'll take them like two weeks to get it done 50 times. They'll realize that they're exponentially better than where they started. So then I just ask a question, Melissa, that I repeat over and over and over until it's ingrained in their mind. And they agree with me. And the question is simply this. 
what else is possible for your communication skills? And then they go, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. And then after the seventh time I ask the question, they go, anything's possible. And I go, exactly. And that's how we, that's how we move it up. That's the psychology behind it anyways. Cool. I like that. That's a good idea. How did you come up with that? Lots of mistakes. Okay. <laughs> Like to, to your point, like, you know, obviously I'm young to, like you said, Melissa, but I think the key is, I think what separated me from other people, because most, most communication coaches are much older than me, like, like the people who, who had, who had facilitated your training at work, guaranteed they're not in their twenties, right? They're probably in their forties or fifties or sixties or something like that. So the way that I gained my expertise wasn't through academia because a lot of facilitators, they get it through academics. So they do like a master's degree in education. They do a PhD in communication, something like that. I have a bachelor's degree in accounting. So I didn't, I didn't go the academia route. I went the mad scientist route, which was I got put in a situation where I was coaching a lot of people for free to help them win competitions. And I was the only person. And I didn't know how I coached myself to be a great speaker because I didn't have a coach. So I would try strategy number one and it didn't work. I tried strategy number two and it screwed up. And then three, four, five, and then seven worked and I took a note on it. And then I just did that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times until it was perfect. And even now it's still not perfect. I'm still iterating, but definitely exponentially better than before. But yeah, I even coach kids, by the way, Melissa. 5% of my time is coaching kids just to make my life harder. <laughs> it's not for money. It's just to make my life harder. So what do you teach the kids? Like what do the... The parents want you to do, I guess. Yeah, so it's mostly presentation skills. I coach my clients as kids mostly because they're they're kids I can manage. They're not like crazy, <laughs> so that's <laughs> so that's always a good, some of them are, but but not all of them. And and it's usually presentation skills. But honestly, for for that specific thing, the reason they let because they just because they see me as a role model for their kids, right? So for them, it's more like Brendan, just do whatever you want for twelve weeks. But it's mostly presentation skills. So what, what I taught them essentially for three months is how do you deliver one presentation perfectly? But the biggest thing that I wanted to get from doing that, and I still do that to this day, is a couple of things. One is where does the fear of communication begin? Like I wanted to witness it because when I because I have multi-age classrooms for that. I do like one group basically. So you have like a five-year-old kid who doesn't question the random word. She just does it. She's like, yeah, random word exercise is cool. But the 13-year-old kid, the 10-year-old kid doesn't want to do it. They're like, oh, I don't know. How do I look? So it kind of shows me where does the fear of communication begin and also why does the fear of communication exist? And then the other piece to that is it just requires a lot more energy. Like you got to be on top of your game. It is 10 times harder to coach a kid than it is an executive. So you got to really show up and go, what's up, kids? And do your whole extroverted thing and and get people excited. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a trip for sure. Yeah, I did a... Uh... It's called like junior achievement. So where I live, they do this thing where they go to like low income schools and they teach kids. They have like a fun two days, I think. I think it's two days or one day. I can't remember. But it's where they get to not do what they are, what they regularly do. And they get to do like this fun learning activity with a bunch of strangers pretending to be teachers. And so I volunteered for that. And yeah, it's a struggle. I don't know how teachers do it every day. And it's insane because they'll be so rowdy and I don't know what to do, but the teacher has to obviously be in the classroom and she'll just like put her hand up and it'll be like, you know, like the silent Fox. I don't know if you did that in school and instantly just quiet. And I'm like, how do they do this? How do teachers do this? Like, how do they just obey them instantly? You know, like I see kids, are super rowdy and their parents just scream at them and they still won't settle down. But a teacher can like, it's with a snap of her finger. Yeah. <laughs> and they're silent. It's crazy. But yeah, I don't know how you teach um, kids. I volunteered and taught, I taught immigrants how to pass their citizenship course or their citizenship whatever it's called or interview, yeah, for their green card and stuff. Yeah. 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 yeah, And so that's when I learned that I didn't want to be a teacher. 
Not that I didn't love my students. I loved my students, but it is a lot of work to it put is. the curriculum together to, you know, identify what's working, what's work, not working and figuring out activities and, you know, why aren't they getting it? And so like, I really admire that you're doing all of this and putting this together. And now you're, you know, hopefully like at a very, very good part and people are really learning from it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, is this something you want to keep doing, you know, as part of your career forever? Is there like other ambitions? I mean, there, there's going to there's gonna be other ambitions for sure, Melissa. But yeah, this is my life's purpose. This is my calling. I'm probably going to do this for the rest of my life. You know, to your point, you know, it, it, in the same way being a basketball player isn't for everyone. I definitely think teaching isn't for everyone either. Because you have to really genuinely like people. Or else you just can't win. Like, of course, you know, if you're the, like, the best teacher in the world and you know how to structure business, you'll do very well for yourself financially. But if you don't have the energy to just keep going, my God, like you're done. You can't, you can't be successful there. So for me, what happened, because my previous life was in tech. I was, I was an SAP consultant at IBM. I was a technology consultant there. And I was leading a lot of implementations. And my goal is to be an executive at IBM for I was 30, essentially. That was my goal. And I was on track to doing that. But I think what I was missing, because I loved my job. That was my dream job. That's what I wanted out of university. That's why I did all those bloody case competitions. But the the goal was not as fulfilling as I thought it would be. You know, I was making really good money. I retired my mom. Life was really good. I had more money than I could ever ask for. And I just said, okay, so what am I doing with my time? And I think that's a big lesson I learned in life is that time is so much more valuable than money. So I just said, what do I want to do with my time? And I realized I had a gift. I looked at the last, you know, my short life. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, what, what, are the, what is the thing that's brought me the most joy in the last five years? And the answer was coaching. I'd done it for free. I never knew you could build a business around it. And so I did and it worked out. That's awesome. So I know you do public speaking coaching, but do you also coach on just plain communications? Yeah, you got it. So it's kind of like uh, the the way that I approach it because every coach has their own style. So for me, it's like it's very focused on on making executives bulletproof. That's basically the the outcome that I sell whenever I when I sell coaching packages. So it's like how do you become a top one percent communicator in your industry? So basically, my 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 ecosystem is like being in the Navy SEALs, like you're doing Navy SEALs training. Where it's not like some B2B workshop where you're just like, hey, like just do this. I just drill clients like crazy. So that's why a lot of people aren't really a fit for me because they can't handle the tough love, the craziness that I am. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the focus mostly. And then sometimes I customize for corporate workshops like the one that you had. But I, I usually only do that for clients that I really like because I don't want to just sit there and go like, oh, like uh, do filler words. No, it's like you have to make this an experience. It's going to be crazy. So, yeah. So it's worked for a couple of them, yeah. Do you think you're going to expand out to more um more on a personal level, like how to like relationship communication or, you know, crucial conversation kind of stuff and um conflict resolution? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, so I I've already started designing content around it cuz I want I want Master to be an encyclopedia for communication. I want an answer for everything. So as my as I scale, I'm actually going to invest in every other communication coach just to see what everyone else has. And I've already started doing that a little bit. But the key is really how do I create that encyclopedia? In terms of the coaching package, it's always about aligning, to make this more of a tip, it's all about aligning kind of what people are willing to pay for. And then once they're in the ecosystem, then you could teach them all the relation communication. It's just what I found from experience is a lot of people say they want it, but they're not really willing to invest in it. Whereas executive comms is really where the where the where the money is, so that I can use that to actually impact more people through the YouTube channel, my free content. Yeah. And along with, you know, doing those other more personal, deeper talks, it's it's equally as important to teach people how to actively listen to. And I remember, so earlier you said that you had to learn how to do that and you have to practice that constantly. So what does that mean? Like, what are you practicing? 
Good question. Because a lot of people say that you got to practice listening, but they don't really give you tactics and specifics on how to do that. So don't worry, I'm different. I'll give you a couple. So, so let's start with the big one. The big one being that most of us need to audit the percentage of questions versus statements that comes out of our mouth on a day-to-day basis. So let me give you an example. Most of the times when we communicate, Melissa, it's always statement, 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 statement. It's a ping-ponging of statements. Well, I believe this. Well, I believe that. Well, I think we should do this. Well, I think we should do that. Whereas what the best communicators on the planet do is they do statement question. So somebody says, well, I believe this. And they respond with, why do you believe that? Why is that important to you? What is it about your point that you find fascinating? What is something that I can learn from this? What feedback do you have for me? So they replace a lot of their statements with questions. So the first thing that's very simple that you actually do very well, because you've asked a ton of questions today, to me anyways, (laughs) is how many questions are we asking other people in a day-to-day life, on a day-to-day basis? And what you'll find very often, Melissa, is that the answer is either zero or one, or sometimes two. So the question is, can we increase that count? So that's an easy way to practice listening. The more questions you ask the world, the more you have to listen to the world. So that's one piece. The other piece that I did for five years and I still do today is I spend two hours every day, most days, I don't get everything right, but like, you know, 60 to 90 minutes listening to somebody else's podcast. And the reason I do this is because since the conversation is already over, because I can't, I can't go, hey, I want to add my input. Like, no, the conversation is done. I, the only option I have left is to sit there and just take notes for 90 minutes. So that's another way to practice listening. A terrible way to practice listening is during an actual conversation with someone. And the reason that is the case, especially if there's two people in that conversation, is because you're always thinking about what you want to say next, and you're not actually spending the whole time focused on listening to them because you want to make an impression. That's why I like the podcast trick and just asking more questions in general because it accelerates the growth really quickly. Yeah, my old director used to say that everyone needs to practice listening to understand and not just to listen to respond. And I love that she says that. She says that all the time and I use it all the time now because it's true. I think some of the best conversations I've had with people are people who actually listen to you because sometimes uh, so I'll talk to someone and, you know, that statement, statement kind of thing. And they'll say something and I'm like, did you even hear what I said? Or there's, you know, they, they're replying to something I said, you know, five minutes earlier or like 30 seconds earlier and not like the last thing I just said, because they're stuck on that first part because they want to respond to that first. And they like, they completely miss the rest of my statement. Oh yeah. I completely agree with that. Is that a lot of us miss and I'm not perfect either. I definitely miss a couple too, but I think the key is just, we just got to get better at it. And it's an overtime process, right? One easy way that I recommend practicing listening since we're on the topic is I recommend making a list of the top three people in your network, people you really admire, and just get on separate 30-minute calls with each of them and just ask them a simple question. What are your top three goals for the year and why are those goals important to you? And just listen to them and just ask questions around those goals. Most people don't do that with their network, which I think is a missed opportunity. Just help each other out. Yeah, I think one-on-ones are super important. My manager does one-on-ones with all her employees. And I thought that was awesome because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have managers who did that and who took the time out of their day. Cause I know managers are busy. Their schedules are super packed, but I never really had a manager take a specific time out of their day every week for every individual person on their team. And I think that's awesome. And that's a, yeah, like you said, a good way to learn how to actively listen and also learn to communicate with somebody and get to know someone. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I just lost the question I was going to say. You're saying how your manager does one-on-ones a lot with the team and how that's new for you. Oh, no. I was going to say that. um, Oh, I lost it. What is it? That's another trick, by the way, in listening. Repeat at least one sentence that the person you were listening to said. So that people go, oh, you actually listened to what I said. So don't do it every time or else it's weird. But if you do it once in a while. Then, uh, yeah. 
It's useful. That makes sense. I try to do that. I have sometimes I have really bad short term memory. I legit think I probably have ADHD <laughs> because I, I'm oh I get sidetracked or I like get distracted easily. Like I have to like clean my whole desk or else I can't you know, concentrate. Like before we got onto this podcast, I cleared my desk. I will, you know, ignore that. But like, <laughs> <laughs> that was funny. Yeah. But in front of me, it's clean, it's clear. Uh, but I was, I was saying that, oh, because you mentioned that I ask a lot of questions. And I think for me, though, um, I do think I'm a good listener, like mainly not, you know, uh, because I'm, you know, I'm uh, gloating or anything, but people legit tell me that I'm a good listener. So I, that's oh, I, I believe think. it. I believe it. <laughs> Thanks, but I, I like asking questions because I am legit like interested. Like, oh, okay, he's talked about that, or like that's interesting. Like, I want to know more about that. And so, I think part of actively listening is also being interested in the person too, you know, it really helps to be interested in what they're doing or what they're saying, because I've been in, I, in conversations where it's just really kind of boring, kind of dull because um, they're just not interested in you or getting to know you're like trying to figure you out. But I, you know, I'm interested, like I want to know how they're doing. I enjoy deep talks and I don't know if you know what a deep talk is, but you know, uh, getting to know someone on a deeper level. Oh yeah, it's like asking weird questions. Like if you were God, what would you do first, and why, and things like that. Yeah, my favorite question. I was trying to think of a question I would ask every episode, and I know I asked like the introduction or thing, but that one's kind of short. And but um, something that's more philosophical. That's more close ended. Yeah, because it's more like, are you this, this, or that? Yeah. Whereas I think the more open-ended ones are, are something more like, like I'll give you one that I ask a lot of my network or people that I meet at like cocktails and stuff is if I made you an instant billionaire, what would you do through time for the rest of your life? Cause you wouldn't have to work anymore. So there's no point in retiring cause you can retire now. So that's, that's a nice open-ended question cause it confuses the shit out of people. <laughs> that's a good question though. Yeah. And it'd be interesting to hear what people say, but I think, I think I want, uh, so I did an episode with my friend on guided journaling. And so every day there's a question and there's journal space. So you get to, you know, just write about the prompt and all that. And so one of the prompts is if you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? Uh. Yeah. And I think that's a really great question because, People constantly don't do things because they think they're going to fail. But if you're not going to fail, what would you do? What would your life look like? What like would you open up a store? Would you be like a giant mogul? Like what would you do? You know. So I think I might ask people that. Yeah. Go for it. I mean, it's your podcast. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. My my version of this, Melissa, is Tony Robbins says it so well. He says the quality of your life is solely determined by the quality of the questions that you ask yourself. My version of Tony's quote is I dare you to ask one hard question about your life every day because if you do that for 30 days, you'll never be the same ever again. I just did that thousands of times. <laughs> so I That's became awful. crazy. <laughs> no, I don't think you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean – that's that goes along the lines of the guided journaling because it's not like weird questions. It's like pretty deep questions, too. Like, uh, here, what's today's? Let me check what today's is. Since I yeah, I got. Phone. And while you're pulling that up, I got another one from Yes Theory. I got a bunch of these, but I mean, we could spend on, on the whole other three hours just on all the questions. There's yeah. one by Yes Theory that's if you were 99 years old right now in your deathbed and you had an opportunity to come back to right now, what would you do right now and why? Jeez. <laughs> you, you think those questions are deep? You guys said nothing yet, Melissa. <laughs> oh, here. Okay. Today's is think for a moment and answer. How does it feel to be you? And when I got that this morning, I was like, damn, how does it feel like to be me? <laughs> I don't even know how to answer When I that. got a running nose, so maybe if I didn't have a running nose, it'd be, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be better. <laughs> so I didn't really... Um, 
I skipped that one because I was like, I don't know. <laughs> you're like, uh, I pass. I'll do tomorrow's. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's funny because you hyped it up so much. You're like, me and my friend are doing guided journaling, Brendan, every single day. <laughs> and then this, you looked at this morning's question. You're like, fuck that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically, I was like, I some of these are hard, and some of them like they make you think really deeply. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm emotionally ready for that. Also. <laughs> My alarm is set at like eight o'clock in the morning so I can spend, you know, a little bit of time in the morning to meditate and think of stuff. But I'm like, this is it's too early for that. <laughs> On to tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow's a brighter day. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, I don't know if there's any like last minute like advice you want to give people or any a message you want to share with them if you want to share any of that for the audience before we go yeah for sure melissa i would say don't forget the most important tip the best way to speak oddly enough weirdly enough coincidentally is to speak <laughs> and that sounds crazy i know it's super complex but the truth is, is that the best way to speak is to speak so if you get anything for this episode, it's this. Have you booked 15 minutes in your calendar tomorrow to do the random word exercise? Because if you're just listening to me and Melissa speak and you ain't speaking, you ain't getting better. So you got to book some time and start speaking because there's something in you, whether it's a small idea, a big idea, or a reason why you want to master communication. Once you find that reason – you'll get out of bed in the morning and not skip the random word exercise in the same way we skipped the question today. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. And if you also want to learn active listening, listen to the podcast and go watch Brandon's YouTube channel, Master Talk. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate the plug. Yeah, of course. And I'll add it to the show notes too so people can find where you're at and yeah, check you out. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I really appreciated this and I'm sure the audience would appreciate it. Public speaking is hard. It's not easy and it does take practice. And I hope someone finds this interesting and finds it helpful and they can go check out your, your free YouTube channel to get the free communication tools. Thanks for making it to the end. If you enjoy what you hear and want to stay up to date on the show, please follow me on Facebook and or on Instagram. You can also check out my website at thetalkativeintrovertpodcast.com. All the information will be on there as well as in the show notes. If you want to help support the show, please review and rate the podcast and share it with your friends and family. Thanks so much and I'll talk to you guys in the next episode.